So here are my three points for the day. Then I'm going to look at the passage, and then we're going to unpack the three points. Got it? We all good? Okay. So point number one, and when you do a three-point sermon, what has to happen with all three points? They have to start with the same letter. Absolutely. So if I'm going to do this three times in my life, I'm going to do it right. Okay? So we're going to start all three of these with the same letter. I had to get a wee little bit creative, but that's okay. All right, so the very first point is expect conflict. Okay? Yeah. Amen. Have a great day. Very first point, expect conflict. The very second point, enter the battle. Enter the battle. I'll unpack it more in a minute. And the third point, engage the actual enemy. Okay? So, the first point was expect. Okay, now you say it. The first point was? Okay, expect conflict. The second point was enter the Okay, so the second point is, and the third point is engage the actual enemy. The third point is, there's actually something about saying it that makes it sink in a little bit more. And so I hope you can remember those. Expect conflict, enter the battle, engage the enemy, the actual enemy, and that's an important word. Now, let's look at this passage. Let me unpack a couple things, do a little demonstration, talk about the three points and then let's go and continue to live our lives and worship and bring glory to God. The whole armor of God, Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 10. I'm not going to read the whole thing again, but I'm going to point out some words in verses 10, 11, and 12. Three verses today. 10, 11, and 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Where are we supposed to be strong? Finally, be strong in the Lord and the strength of his might in the Lord. That is important. That is key. How many of us have experienced the tendency to try to figure things out on our own? All of us. I got this, God. I got this. You go take a nap. You and Paul, go take a nap, okay? Because I got this. I'm good. But Paul is reminding us and warning us that that's not actually true. I mean, we got the power of Jesus in us, but it, that power is only in Jesus. So finally, be strong in the Lord, and I love this, and in the strength of his might, or by his mighty power. Because we don't have the strength to take on this enemy and to do it on our own. We have to have the strength of God, and he offers it to us. Because we're going to have conflicts come our way. So just wanted to point that out. Now let's look at the next verse, verse 11. He says, put on the whole armor of God. That you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. How would you define schemes? If you had to try to define that. And that's actually not rhetorical. I'm asking. What do you think, Gare? deceptions okay it's kind of trickery right so a scheme is something where I'm really trying to fool you or or um, I'm trying to deceive you or trick you it's a lie so a scheme is based on a lie and Satan is called the father of lies and that's what he uses does he come at us with our actual struggle and put it out as what it really is. Let's say our struggle, and I'm, I'm going to use a word here, and I know we've got junior hires in the room. It's important to hear this, though. Let's say our struggle is sexual temptation. So is he going to come at us and come at us with how ugly it can be, or is he going to come at us and make it look absolutely perfect and beautiful? He's going to make it look absolutely perfect and beautiful because he deceives. Because it's a scheme. He's trying to fool us. And a lot of times, unfortunately, he succeeds. And so we're told to put on the whole armor of God. We're going to talk about that over the next two weeks. So we're not going to go into detail about the armor today. 
But he says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. One final point I want to point out to you. Um, It's, well, let me ask this. We're supposed to put on what? The armor of God. So what does that mean? Don't get into the six or whatever parts of the armor. I'm just, what does that mean to put on the armor of God? He's our only defense. It's his strength. Here's, here's the, the thing I want to point out because this did not hit me until this year studying this passage. And I've studied this passage a long, long, long time. The armor of God. I always treated it as the armor that God gives. Would you agree? So the armor of God is like the phone of PJ. And if I give the phone to Brad, oh, you can take it. I'm going to take it back. (laughs) It's PJ's phone, the phone of PJ, okay? But it isn't just that it's the armor of God like God gave it to me. It's that this is the armor that God wore when he became a human being and came down to the earth. This is the armor that Jesus wore when he withstood the temptations of Satan in the wilderness for 40 days. This is the armor that he had on. This is vintage armor. This is signed, autographed, the armor of Jesus. He took it off. He gives it to us. It isn't just from God. It was worn by God. Have you ever thought about it that way? I love that thought. The word in Greek D-E means from or of. It's from God, but it is of God because he wore it. When he withstood the temptation, he had a helmet of salvation on. He had the breastplate of righteousness. He had it on his feet, shoes with the readiness of the gospel because he used the sword of the spirit and he came at Satan and his temptations with the word of God, with the sword of the spirit. He had a belt of truth around him. He wasn't going to let the lies creep in. He had a um, shield of faith that protected him from the missiles that were coming. Jesus wore this armor. He takes it off and he gives it to you. It's not just the armor from God. It's the armor of God. I've never heard that. I've never read that before. I've never preached that, but it came out as I was studying that that's true about this armor. And I just think that's cool. So that's verse 11. Now let's look at verse 12. And then let's talk about our three points. And then let's head out to enjoy the life God has given us and to continue our worship outside as we get to fight the battle and expect conflict and engage the actual enemy. Verse 13, for we do not wrestle, I like that word, how many of you like to wrestle? Um, It was when our kids were toddlers, they liked to wrestle a little bit more, they'd crawl all over you, we called it wrestling, Um, we don't wrestle a whole lot now, but we have wrestling matches in life, and I like that word. Because there's a competition. There's an actual opponent. And it's hand-to-hand physical combat. That's what we are going to engage in with the enemy. Hand-to-hand physical combat. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood. But against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil, I love this, in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God. And we're just going to stop right there um, because we're going to go into the rest of it later on. It does mention prayer, and we definitely want to be people of prayer. Um, And we're even going to wrap this around prayer today. 
Because every week we're going to be bringing that up because I think that's the offensive weapon that isn't mentioned in the armor of God is prayer. But it's mentioned at the end to do everything with prayer and supplication, presenting our request to God. Gary, was that a hand? I want to make sure. This is life or death. This is not a sparring match. Um, you know, we could get Albert and Melanie up here and they could spar against each other in jujitsu or something. And they would go easy on each other because it's not life or death. This is war. Okay? So when I said expect conflict, conflict meaning war, and the wrestling match is to the death. The wrestling match is to the death. So thank you for pointing that out. So let's look at, at our, our three points here real quick. Um, point number one, don't need to spend much time here. Expect conflict. Have any of you ever experienced conflict in your life? Raise your hand. Okay. Everybody, raise your hand. Some of you are like, still not raising your hands. And um, we got to break out of that at some point. So I'm just going to make you do it every once in a while. We've all experienced conflict, right? Yeah. Can I hear it? Amen. Uh-huh. Do we like it? No. No. But we're going to experience it. God told us to expect it. This passage is in here saying expect conflict. If we weren't supposed to expect conflict, they wouldn't have had to put this in there. Because we wouldn't have to have armor. Because Life would just be all peachy and we'd be in a garden and we'd be running around naked and eating all the fruit except for one tree. But we had to go and ruin it. Adam and Eve had to go and ruin things. I'm going to say both of them ruined it because we're going to move into our second point because we don't need to spend any more time on expect conflict. Do we all get that? We understand that? It's going to come. It's going to happen. Don't be surprised by it. Because God told us it was going to come our way. Right? We got it? Okay? So that's the first. But we need to know that. I am amazed at how many Christians are shocked when conflict comes their way. And I'm shocked that they're shocked. Because God told us. It's not going to be easy. But I am with you. And I'm going to take care of this. So the second point now. Let's move into that one. Um. The first one is expecting the conflict. Now, we know it's going to come, but this second E, I think, is really important. Enter the battle. And this one we do need to spend a little time on because I think sometimes we have a tendency to say, if I don't look at it, maybe it will go away. Conflict's over here. Okay, let's say I'm having a conflict with Levi. He's over here. So if I don't look at it and I ignore it, maybe it'll go away. Nope, didn't go away. Tried to hide. Didn't go away. Still didn't go away. Is it ever going to go away? No. Enter the battle. I think we as a church have gotten out of the habit of war. You see, we've fought battles we shouldn't fight, and we turn our back on the battles that we should fight. And I think we got to turn that around. We need to stop fighting some of the battles that we should just let go, but the battles that matter, the battles that have an eternal consequence, the battles in our families and marriages and, and inside the church and relationships, because do they ever get messy? Uh-huh. Yeah? Those are what we fight for instead of letting those go. And so the first thing is to expect conflict, but the second I think is really important. It says, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the attacks and the schemes of the devil because he's dreaming up a way to trick you and to come at you. I think a lot of times we just want to ignore it and let it go. Um, I do that sometimes as a Lutheran pastor. 
in our synod, in our church body. There are battles that need to be fought, and I really could care less about them. But they could ultimately one day take away truly our freedom and make us prisoners. And so is that a battle worth fighting? You bet it is. So I need to fight that battle. And I don't like to fight political battles because I figure I'm going to face persecution. It's just what Jesus told me. I'm expecting conflict to come. But he also says, enter into the battle. If we weren't supposed to enter the battle, would he have told us to put on the armor? This is not a football game. I love this idea. Wouldn't you love to be the poor sap that puts on the shoulder pads and the helmet and he hasn't seen playing time in 10 years on that football team? Because he's like the third and fourth string. But he's on the roster. He's a paid player. And he suits up and he, sit that back, he sits back on the little bench with the heater blowing on him when it's snowing. He's drinking his latte, just enjoying the football game. He got all suited up, but he's not going to do anything, is he? And if he actually gets called in the game, he's probably going to be shocked. And he may not even know what to do. Now, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I, I think that's the way a lot of sometimes football players are. They get all dressed up for nothing because they'll never get into the game. Well, that's the way a lot of Christians have become. We're told to put on the armor of God. I think we forget to put it on because we have no intention of entering into the battle. Why? Because that could be dangerous. That might be hard in there. I might offend somebody. I might lose something that's valuable to me. That might actually require effort. And I think the church, and I'm talking worldwide, okay, I think at Community of Hope, we experience some laziness here. I'll be honest, we're not perfect. But I think we've got a better percentage and a better track record than the church worldwide. Because the church is supposed to be engaged in the battle of living for the kingdom of God on a daily basis. We're told to put on the armor of God for a reason. It's because he wants us to enter the battle. Very important something we need to point out. The final one, um, I kind of want to demonstrate this last one. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I think I'm going to go with Chris today. Uh, Branscombe, not Thacker. Chris Branscombe. Did he leave? Is he back with the kids? Okay. Gary, I'm going to pick on you then. Okay. Gary, will you be my volunteer? going to enter the battle, right? Okay, Gary, what is this? Yeah, it's a bandana. It's going to become a blindfold. So we are going to blindfold Gary here. We good? We good. Okay, and Gary, we're just going to have you stand right here, okay? Um, so what was the first point? Anybody? Expect conflict, okay? Expect that it's going to come, all right? Because it's going to happen. Now, we're supposed to enter the battle. You're not doing a real good job. Okay, why don't you stop it? Okay? Oh, that was almost. Oh, ha, ha, woo! Push shut, okay? Enter the battle. Because we're going to get beat up on whether we enter the battle or not. So we might as well stay and fight. Let's go back to Braveheart. Let's not get dressed up for nothing, okay? So, what was the third point? Does anyone remember what I said? Engage the actual enemy. It was a good try. 
He's trying to engage the enemy, but what is difficult? He can't see the enemy. Can we see our enemy? No. Let me ask that again. Can we see our enemy? No. Does that put us at a disadvantage? Yes. We have to pray for what? Eyes to see. Okay, so let's, let's take this off. Okay? Now, was I the enemy? Ah, uh-uh. I'm not the enemy. Because I am what? Flesh and blood. Okay? You're supposed to engage. Yeah. Okay? Because we're going to expect conflict, there we go, and fight it off. We're going to enter the battle. Take the broom. Exactly. Take the weapon, right? Turn it into a sword because it's going to be used against us. Um, I think we, we have a difficult, thank you, Gary. We have a difficult time because we can't see our enemy. And so what we tend to do is we tend to take the invisible enemy that's the actual enemy. The one that we're supposed to engage, but we can't take him on because we can't see him. We're blindfolded. And so we take what we can see, and if, if we weren't doing this talk and this demonstration, what would Gary automatically think? Who is his enemy right now? Me. Because what am I doing? I'm the one beating him with a broom. Gently. I'm gently beating you with a broom. Okay? Because I don't want to hurt you. Exactly. I, I use that end, not this end, for a reason. Um, but what we often will tend to do when we do engage the battle is we engage it incorrectly. Because we don't engage the actual enemy. We engage the one that we can see. We engage the flesh and blood. Now think about the ramifications of that. Y'all give Gary a hand. Thank you very much, Gary. Think about the ramifications of that, okay? Someone give me an example. It's not because I didn't plan this out in the sermon and I don't have one. I got one. I got two. Well, you got an example for me? What's an example where we could engage the enemy and it's not actually the real enemy, but it's the one we can see? Alcohol um, can get in the way and it can, it can cloud our perception of things. And then what can happen is we can look at the person, the person who invited us, the person who's pushing it, and we can instantly think that's the enemy. And we can react and engage them in a battle or a war when that's not actually the enemy. There's something else behind that enemy. Gary, did you have another example? Pride, okay? How so? And so what, what can happen there um, is, let's say two people are disagreeing. Huh, that would never happen, would it? It's a very hypothetical situation. Two people are going to disagree. Can there be a conflict because of pride between those two people? If no one is willing to give in, to maybe acknowledge that they were wrong, or that the other person could have been right, because of pride, there can be a conflict. There could even, it could turn into a fight, right? It could turn into an actual fight. It's an actual fight against flesh and blood, which isn't the real enemy. The real enemy is the schemer, the deceiver, trying to work his way and to find our weak point and to push the buttons, whether it's pride or greed or lust, any temptation that he might want to push, to push our buttons to cause us to sin and then to blame somebody else 
instead of acknowledging that somehow Satan was behind that. I see this in marriage all the time. Because in marriage, I mean, people don't just tap anymore. I mean, they, they go at each other, don't they, sometimes? Shouldn't be. What's that? They go for the juggler. It shouldn't be. I really shouldn't break Frank's broom. I already have to buy them a new key. All right, we're good. We're not going to do that again. But those are hard shots. You ever taken a hard shot at the wrong opponent in a marriage? See, it isn't the wife and it wasn't the husband. There's actually something behind the action that the wife or the husband did. Sometimes there are huge ramifications, consequences, and we might have to leave. But a lot of times we never see that. And so we don't fight the real battle. And the real battle, God said, I want you to put on the armor. Man, I want you to have this belt, first of all, okay? The belt of truth. I want you to have a belt of truth on. Because the lies are going to be, sw- you're going to be swimming in them. They're all around you. You've got to see the truth through the midst of all the lies. And I see husbands and wives do this all the time. I see parents do this with their children. Have you ever seen a child consider their parent the enemy? Or have you ever seen a parent consider the child the enemy? I've seen both. And it's horrible. The parent is not the enemy and the child is not the enemy. The enemy is the enemy. And so we're supposed to expect the conflict. We're supposed to enter the battle, but we need to engage the correct opponent, the actual enemy. This is spiritual warfare. I love some of the accounts in Scripture about spiritual warfare. You've got them in the New Testament and the Gospels. You can look in Luke. You can look in Matthew, Mark. You've got demon possession, and you've got someone that's taken over spiritually and God recognizes the poor sap that the demon has taken over isn't the enemy. It's the spirit controlling him inside of him that's the enemy. And so that spirit is cast out and that spirit is removed, sometimes sent into swine and it's, it, it, it cries out a lot, not now, not now, this isn't the time because it knows one day the time will come. But see, when Jesus died on the cross, the war ended. There's still little battles, but the war ended. As a follower of Jesus Christ, you're not going to lose. You're on the winning team because the war is over. The battles still spring up, and we have to engage the actual enemy. And if you do it on your own strength, man, you're going to get taken out. You will get taken out. Be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God. It's not just a belt of truth. That's a foundational thing because who wants to get caught in war with your pants down? Would that be pretty humiliating to walk into war and your, your drawers drop? I, it puts you at an incredible disadvantage, right? That is the practical nature of a belt. But that's the practical nature of the truth. Because when we go in believing the lies, we're at a, a critical disadvantage. So we have to have truth and a helmet of salvation. We're going to get into all of those things. The shield, the breastplate of righteousness, the sword of the spirit, um, or the, the shoes of the gospel. We're going to look at every one of those over the next couple of weeks. But today, we had to just set it up. Expect conflict. Enter the battle. Don't sit back and watch. But engage the actual enemy. Now, how do we do that? Real quick, real quick. I think, number one, we do that through prayer, and we're going to spend some time right now in prayer. But I also think, because this was whose armor? It was Jesus' armor. This is the way Jesus withstood the attacks that came at him. With truth and righteousness and the word of God, the gospel of peace, the sword of the Spirit, the Word of God. He did it through prayer. I guarantee you. 
He was communicating with his father the whole time he was tempted in the wilderness. He did it with a shield of faith. And he had salvation guarding his mind. Because when you don't eat for 40 days and 40 nights and you're being tempted to eat, you have to withstand the attack of the enemy because he uses mind games. And, and Satan even tried to turn around the word of God on him. But Jesus knew the truth. And so he stood firm and he engaged the actual enemy as he entered the battle and took care of the conflict. So the two ways that we're going to do this are through prayer and by having a weapon. And I think one weapon is prayer, but the other weapon is the word of God. That's where Ephesians 6 comes from. So many Christians do not have a weapon. So many followers of Christ can't produce one Bible verse, five Bible verses, ten Bible verses, a hundred Bible verses, a thousand Bible verses, and there are tens of thousands of verses in there. But so many of us don't know the Word of God, and so we don't use it in battle, and so we keep losing because we're trying to fight on our own. And we're blindfolded and we're not able to see the enemy and it's going to be tough. So I just want to encourage you to pick up the word of God and start to read it. To allow the word of God to be a weapon that you use and it's truth that you use to fight the actual enemy and not the one that we can see. So expect what? Enter the engage the the actual enemy 